In the last video, we migrated our static GRE tunnels to a Phase 1 DMVPN topology. This is far more scalable and easy to manage. But there are still some rough areas that we need to improve on, and that's what we're doing in this video. Phase 1 DMVPNs were the very first type of DMVPN. They allow us to take a spoke router and dynamically register it with the hub. This is great because there is less static configuration, and as the hub router has only a single tunnel interface, there's less to manage as well. But the spokes, they remain fairly static. They still have a regular GRE tunnel, which has a single endpoint. But what if one spoke needs to communicate with another spoke? Going back to our example from the last video, we have a head office, which is where we put the hub router. There are spoke routers at each retail outlet. Eventually, some outlets grow into larger regional offices. These are still spoke routers, but the local outlets need to reach them directly. Our phase one network is not sophisticated enough to handle this. Traffic from the outlet will travel all the way to the hub router, which is in a different part of the country, where it is decapsulated. The hub will then encapsulate the traffic again and send it to the regional office. And the same happens again for the return traffic. There are two problems that stand out here. Firstly, this places an additional load on the hub router and its internet link. Imagine this happening over several hundred spoke routers. Also, the two spokes that need to communicate are quite close geographically, but they still need to send traffic a great distance, interstate in this example. This adds unnecessary latency. And so now it's time for us to fix this. In response to this limitation, phase two was created. This is very similar to phase one, but with some tweaking on the spokes. In fact, it's so similar that the hub configuration remains exactly the same. The spokes still register with the hub and the hub still records this information in a database. The real difference is on the spoke routers. Right now we have a static GRE tunnel where the hub is a destination. Phase 2 changes this to an MGRE tunnel. Just like the hub, they no longer have a static endpoint. This means that they have potential to send tunnel traffic to places other than hub routers, direct to other spokes, for example. But we still have a problem. How does one spoke learn about another spoke? There is no tunnel to NBMA mapping like we had for the hub, and we don't want to add this manually, as that wouldn't be scalable. Well, the hub has a mapping of all the spokes and their NBMA addresses. Why don't we ask it? One spoke will know that it needs to reach another spoke because it's already done a lookup, either through the routing table or a Ceph table, and has seen that the next hop IP is on the tunnel interface. So now it needs to learn which NBMA address maps to this tunnel IP. To do this, the spoke sends an NHRP request message to the hub. This is asking the hub which NBMA address to use for the tunnel IP. The hub looks in its NHRP database, finds the entry, and forwards the resolution message to the destination spoke router. The spoke router caches the information in the request and sends an NHRP resolution response message directly to the original spoke. Now the spoke knows how to reach the other spoke, it can encapsulate traffic and send it there directly. This is called an on-demand tunnel. This connection is built only as needed and is torn down when it is no longer needed. This is in contrast to the always up tunnel between the hub and spoke. But something we need to consider is how multicast works. We can't do true multicast because each spoke doesn't know where all the other spokes are. Instead, a spoke will send multicast traffic to the hub the hub will forward this traffic on to all the spokes in its database. This wasn't an issue in phase one, as all traffic flowed through the hub anyway. Let's see it in action once again. We'll start with the topology that we configured in the last video. You'll remember that this is configured as a phase one topology. This is no longer suiting our needs, so we're going to convert it to phase two. Downloadable labs are available on the website for Patreon subscribers if you want to follow along or try it out yourself. The configuration for phase two 
only affects the spoke routers. There are no changes at all needed on the hub router. Our starting point is converting the regular GRE tunnel to an MGRE tunnel. This means removing the static destination and changing the tunnel type. Multicast is also a consideration now, so we configure the next hop server as the destination for our multicast traffic. Notice that this is the NBMA address of the hub. A show DMVPN tells us that the tunnel to the hub is still up. And now we'll quickly run through the same config on spoke two. And we can see that the tunnel to the hub is up here too. Nothing between the spoke routers at this time. A trace route from spoke two to spoke one shows that the traffic is flowing through the hub first while the tunnel is being built. Once the on-demand tunnel is up, traffic will flow directly from spoke to spoke. You may wonder, why does traffic flow through the hub first? Don't we have a route directly between the spokes? Well, this is because of Ceph. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but basically Ceph doesn't have a complete adjacency between the spokes until the tunnel is up. So not knowing how to get there, the traffic falls back to the hub until the tunnel is formed and the full Ceph adjacency is built. So now everything's great, right? We have spoke to spoke tunnels. We've taken the load off the hub. We've lowered the latency. What else could we want? It's true that our network is now better than it was. But while we've improved in most areas, we have introduced a new problem. Remember earlier that we talked about spokes sending resolution requests to the hub? It wants to know which NBMA address matches a tunnel address. The spoke knew which tunnel address to send to, but it didn't know the destination's real address. So let's consider for a moment, how did the spoke know which tunnel address to use in the first place? Well, it looked in his routing table, of course. In phase one, we could simply use a default route or maybe a summary pointing towards the hub router. And that's the problem with phase two. To build direct spoke to spoke tunnels, the spoke router needs to know about all of the routes itself. The next hop for a route will point to another spoke router. We cannot use a default route or summary routes that point to the hub anymore. For a small network, this may not be a big issue. But in our scenario, we have several hundred retail outlets. That's a lot of routes that each spoke needs to know about and process. Now that may mean that we now need to buy bigger routers for every one of our outlets, which is an expense that we don't want to bear. So what do we do? Do we have large routing tables everywhere? Or do we route everything through the hub? How do we decide between these two? Well, good news, there's a third option, and that is called phase three. Phase three allows spoke to spoke communication and summary routes pointing back to the hub. Is it magic? No, it's just more NHRP trickery. If a spoke wants to send traffic to another spoke, it no longer starts the process by sending an NHRP resolution request. Instead, it has a summary that uses the hub as its next hop and just starts sending traffic there. That's basically the way it used to work in phase one. The hub gets the traffic and forwards it onto the spoke. It knows where the spoke is because of its NHRP database. But the hub knows that there is a better path that these spokes can use. If it's configured for phase three, it will send an NHRP redirect message back to the spoke. This is a bit like IP redirects. It simply says, hey, there's a better path, why don't you use it? The spoke gets this message and realizes that it can do better. It sends a resolution request to the hub. This includes its own reachability information. The hub forwards the message on to the destination spoke, who sends the resolution response directly to the original spoke. The two spokes now have each other's tunnel address to NBMA address mappings, so they can build a tunnel between themselves. This sounds good, but it's not much of an improvement on phase two yet. All we've done is add redirect messages. But there's still more. Remember how we have a default or summary route pointing to the hub? That would cause all traffic to flow through the hub, wouldn't it? 
not in phase three. On the spokes, we now use a shortcut command. Now that the spokes have a direct path, they can update their routing tables with a shortcut route. This means that the remote spokes tunnel IP address is now the next hop IP. If this exact route is already in the routing table, pointing to the hub, an override route is added, and we'll see this in action soon. So now we'll convert our phase two lab to phase three. Once again, the labs are available for download if you want them. The first part is enabling redirects on the hub. This enables the hub to tell the spoke that there's a shorter path that it can use. The second part is enabling shortcuts on both spokes. This enables the spokes to install a shortcut route when they receive a redirect. And that's it. From a configuration perspective, we're done. We can see the traffic flows through the hub while the tunnel is being built. After this, traffic flows directly between the spokes. Looking at the tunnels, we still have the static tunnel to the hub. We now also have the dynamic tunnel between the spokes. This is something that we see in both phase two and phase three. But the real phase three magic is in the routing table. Right now, we have a mostly empty routing table, so there's no connectivity to the networks behind the spoke routers. To fix this, we'll quickly add in some summary routes to these networks. The next hop for these will be the hub router. So firstly, ping confirms that we have connectivity. If we have another look at the routing table now, we see not only the summary route that we created, but there's also this more specific route here. It's marked with an H code, which we can see is an NHRP route. It's listed as a slash 24, as that's the size of the network on the spoke. It's more specific than the summary route that we created. But what if we had a route that matched that slash 24 exactly? That is an exact route, not a summary route. When we do this, the routing table now has a percent sign next to the route. This code means next hop override. It's saying we already have a route to this destination, but NHRP just taught us a better way to get there. You've now seen the basics of phase one, phase two, and phase three DMVPN. I recommend really understanding the differences between each of them. You can get summaries of these on the website. In the future, we're looking at routing over DMVPN and any special considerations there. We'll also have a look at a few more advanced concepts like multi-hub and hierarchical deployments. Let me know what you thought of this video in the comments below.